Okay, let's get moving. So I'm Paul Edwards. I'm here at CSAC and also director of the FTS program. It's a great pleasure to introduce Anna Weissel Brown today. She was a nuclear security fellow here in 2016-18. She has a PhD from the University of Chicago and she's been through a, a series of other uh, positions in, is currently a Berg Gruen Fellow in Los Angeles. Is that where that is? Yeah. And she has uh, three research projects going one on the nuclear order of things, bureaucracy, objectivity, and boredom at the IAEA, another on governing the Anthropocene, technologies of truth and trust, and finally, down with MS Word, tools of scholarly knowledge and practice. I'm with you on that. And PowerPoint is even worse. So I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you, Paul. Um, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Harold, for reaching out and inviting me to come speak to this wonderful audience. Thank you all for being here um, uh, and, and to being willing to listen to my somewhat still new, it still feels like a new research project. I started working on it um, sort of when I left CSAC in 2018. and people in Silicon Valley were talking about blockchain and trustlessness. And I was like, well, that sounds ridiculous. What are they doing? Um, so I've gone down this path or down this rabbit hole. There are many. Um, and yeah, I'm broadly interested, or this project is about trust, sort of what it is, and the technologies and infrastructures that we as humans develop in order to somehow build trust or to allow us to coordinate, um, which of course also includes questions of governance. So. Thank you so much for being here and um, let's get going. Um, I wanna start with a caveat because whenever I tell people I study crypto and blockchain and Web3, they're like, well, that's a terrible dumpster fire. Why are you doing that? Um, you know, they're you know, burning down the planet. So I'm sure maybe some of you know this website created by Molly White, where she sort of chronicles all the, the hacks and fraud and corruption and all the scandals that are happening in crypto. And there's a lot of terrible stuff. Um, this is a picture I took at this crypto conference last year where, you know, I guess somebody really needed, a, I don't know, was it a Maserati or a Ferrari with the, the Shiba Inu Doge coin icon a plastered all over it. So, you know, as an example of something ridiculous that people in this space would do, um, I, I share this um, critique, I share the skepticism um, and the horror at some of the crazy things that are happening. Um, at the same time, I think that the, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't study it. Um, I think that means that, you know, especially or yes, I mean, there are people studying Nazis, right? Like, it, just because they're bad people doesn't mean like, you know, we shouldn't study them. And second, what I found going into this space is actually sort of a, an interesting pocket of it that is, you know, very pro social and interested in the commons and interested in transforming social and political and economic orders and thinking sort of big about um, what it is um, we are, you know, what society we're in and how we want to change it. Um, and, you know, most of these people are techno utopians and think that the technology will have some important role to play in, in this vision. Um, so I hope you'll consider setting your aversion aside and come with me for the duration of this talk and perhaps, yeah, find something interesting. Um, I'll start with Bitcoin, which is often sort of the, the beginning point of this. Um, and um, the, the sort of claim that Bitcoin allows people to avoid trust, which is very explicit in the pseudonymous author Satoshi Nakamoto's white paper, um, which uh, you know, birthed Bitcoin and articulated its principles in, in 2008. So at the heels of the financial crisis. Um, and what he um, claims is that Bitcoin permits anonymous actors to transact with each other without needing to trust a third party, right? So it is 2008, there's a financial crisis, and there's great skepticism of the banks uh, and the financial institutions. Um, so the claim is further that blockchain is transparent, right? That the code is there for all to see, uh, for all to inspect and investigate the record of transactions that the blockchain ledger encodes. And there's no need to know anyone else or rely on some institution's reputation in order to transact with others on the internet. And this is accomplished through a combination of technological means. There's uh, cryptography is central to this, um, but I will happily refer to uh, experts on campus who are able to explain this far more effectively 
than I can. I used to have a slide explaining like what does the blockchain do and how does it sort of and you know how does it work cryptographically. Um, I'm happy to try to explain that or maybe Herb can. Um, but I don't know. I feel like it's almost beside the point. But um, I'm more interested in the claims about what it can do rather than what it actually does. Um, so this ledger can become the thing that we rely on, right? We could maybe even say that we trust to the ledger instead of some third party. And Bitcoin is a project that tries to minimize and eliminate trust in humans and human devised institutions. And while uh, Nakamoto doesn't use the term trustless in the white paper, it's a term that has become widespread to describe a technological aspiration for blockchain. And trust and trustlessness are also terms in computing, right? They're like terms of art to describe the qualities of certain um, networks. Um, and there's, I think there's some interesting slippage too between how you know, all of us use the term trust and the way that the, the engineering uses the term. So the biggest blockchain contender in the sort in the cryptocurrency space and the contender to Bitcoin is the Ethereum blockchain platform. Um, it's founded by primarily Vitalik Buterin um, and Gavin Woods. And while uh, Bitcoin is designed as a currency and a store of value, the open source Ethereum network is an open source blockchain intended for complex smart contracts and decentralized applications. And it is the ecosystem, as they call it, that's most closely associated with what has come to be called Web3, a vision of the internet based on blockchains, open source, and decentralization. And if Bitcoin is characterized as a platform of libertarians eager to break from the state, Ethereum is a less cynical, more colorful, and playful sort of space ecosystem characterized by a cartoon-like aesthetic. And the, this is the Buffy corn. Um, it is one of the mascots that the Ethereum Foundation uses to articulate. I think this is probably taken in Denver uh, at the last conference, which I went to. Um, that was my first sort of more in-depth kind of field work moment. It was the, um, it took place in uh, February, 20, uh, February of last year in Denver, it's East Denver. Um, there's, it was like a big conference. There was a hackathon. There's many speakers over several days. Um, it was the first time back uh, in person after COVID. The previous year it had been online. There, you know, this is a kind of conference to which you don't have to pay money to attend. The tickets were free. The coffee was free. There were free lunch tokens, um, you know, sponsored by a variety of companies. And there's also free COVID. Uh, the first time I got COVID <laughs> was, even though, you know, uh, trying to wear a mask, a lot of people weren't wearing masks and we all sort of reflected on the, the pressure to take off your mask because it was hard to hear, you know, there were a lot of people and things like that. So Let's um, trust each other. Yes, in a sense. Um, so aside from the program, um, almost everyone there was also there for the free swag, right? Um, and I came across this drawstring bag given out by Polkadot and was very intrigued. Polkadot is a blockchain designed to permit cross-blockchain interoperability, and it was co-founded by Gavin Wood, who is one of the co-authors of Ethereum. And the slogan can be traced back, so for those of you in the back, less, it says, less trust, more truth. And the slogan can be traced back to some of the things that Wood has articulated in interviews, that trust is bad in itself because it required individuals to depend on, quote unquote, arbitrary authorities who might abuse their power. And truth in his theory is what you have when you can be certain that your expectations can be met. Um, in some other publicity materials connected to Gavin Wood and his activities, truth has also been defined as the verifiable state of the network. So that's a definition that's much closer to sort of the technology into blockchain, right? Um, so you, you can see that these um, words are sort of signifiers that are very capacious. Um, they can contain a lot of different um, perspectives and sort of um, concurrent meanings. So the blockchain, it seems, allows individuals to not need to trust each other because they can depend on a network to produce a verifiable state that can allow them to interact with it with certainty that their expectations of it will be met. And I'm wondering whether any of this might sound familiar, especially the verifiable part. So um, in the 1990s, this is very familiar to people in this room. Reagan, of course, used the Russian rhyming proverb translated as trust but verify in his interactions with Gorbachev. 
And his use of the proverb uh, acknowledges trust as a necessary quality in the matter of arms control negotiations, but pairs this quality with practices of verification to create certainty and reassurance, if not quite truth. And maybe David has something to say about the, the, the Russian context of that proverb and the way that it's used. Um, and in 2015, I remember watching live, I've never watched these things live, but this was important. It was the announcement of the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, the Iran deal that um, Obama announced with Vice President Biden standing there loyally next to him. Um, and uh, what I noticed is that in, in his speech, Obama updated this, um, this proverb for a more suspicious political moment and described the JCPOA as a deal that was not built on trust, but on verification. So trust here is jettisoned in the dealings with the duplicitous Iranians for the perhaps firmer verification, the making true. And this is, you know, 2015, not quite yet post-truth and fake news era. In 2020, um, I didn't want to honor him by take, putting a picture of him up there, but Trump's Secretary of State, um, Mike Pompeo, gave a speech at the Nixon Presidential Library um, where he noted that in dealing with China, the US al and, and its allies needed to distrust and verify. So we see a stepwise escalation towards increasing distrust, at least in this realm. And um, we, I want to keep these in mind as sort of lenses and as comparisons against which to examine and evaluate claims about trust, truth, and verification in crypto. And to then ask, what is it that blockchain promises to realize? Um, here we have the covers of a few kind of more popular titles on um, blockchain, works on blockchain. There's um, the first two authors are sort of talking about that they're not here to throw out trust, but rather they see the blockchain as a socio-technical infrastructure that can restore and build up societal trust in a moment of increasing and profound uh, mistrust in established institutions. So Casey and Vigna in the middle um, make a claim that the blockchain it's almost like an extension of God's big book. They sort of have this you know, capacious um, history, um, a ledger in which all that is is written down um, and that the blockchain in that sense can serve as a consensus-based form of truth. So they're not really that interested in you know, truth as, as some kind of like immediate representation of reality, but they do have a notion of a kind of a consensus of like of what we agree is true. And Kevin Warbach, a legal scholar sees blockchain as an infrastructure that can support and to an extent transform existing legal firm frameworks and also sort of provide or um, yeah, provide the conditions under which trust can flourish again. And then I just found this um, the other day while uh, coming up with this presentation, Victoria Lemieux, um, and I haven't read it therefore, but I thought it was also an interesting take on the thinking of trust and information. Um, she offers a specific discussion of blockchain's archival recording promises compared to centuries of archival practice concerned with the integrity and authenticity of information. So here we also have um, a sort of contextualizing blockchain's promises vis-a-vis -vis other practices that were trying to do similar things. So is uh, verification seems to be a promise of some kind of mechanical reckoning of the truth. And um, the technology or blockchain is held up as a means to realize coordination among anonymous individuals or individuals who might not trust each other. And next I offer up some similar examples. So my perspective on blockchain is one that's trying to take a longer historical um, kind of trajectory or, or you know, the existence of um, needing certain devices in order to um, facilitate coordination across people. Um, that this, you know, blockchain in a sense is not quite new. So these are medieval tally sticks and tally sticks have been used since the upper paleolithic. Um, they were first mentioned in ancient times. They were uh, devices for record keeping and for and, uh, mnemonic devices. Um, and these, the medieval ones are about keeping records of debts. Um, and I don't know if you know David Graeber, the economic anthropologist has written a, a big book about debt and about tally sticks as one of the ways that these are done. So a tally stick is usually uh, a piece of uh, squared hazelwood stick um, that was marked with a system of notches and then split lengthwise. In this way, the two halves both record the same notches and each party to the transaction receives one half of the marked stick as proof, right? 
um, so in a, in, they also were nearly tamper-proof because the way that the um, split sticks can only be put together again is with the right one, right? If you have, if you've ever, I don't know, made a fire or something, you know that kind of the quality of wood. And eventually, the two were actually made to be two different sizes. And the longer the creditor side became known as stock. So here we have the um, the origin of the word stock. So I, I just bring this up as an example of a socio-technical device whose material qualities afford the users um, certain semiotic properties of reckoning, comparison, accounts, and counting. And then similarly, but in a different context, and I, you know, I wouldn't want to be remiss in promoting myself and my work, but also to make the connection to the nuclear clear in a way, um, these are uh, tamper-indicating seals that the IAEA uses in its nuclear verification practices. And uh, in an article that came out in 2019 that I was laboring over while a postdoc here, um, I make the argument that these seals are only apparently binary signals, right? Or we think of them as binary signals, but I show the work that goes into making them as such, like to making them be able to signal in a, in a, in a binary manner. Um, but, and then once they're broken, right? So all this work goes into making them binary. And then once they're broken and tampered with, it's clear that they've been tampered with, but what it means is not, right? So then the process of trying to understand what, what this breaking of the seal means um, sort of commences. And so in this article, I argue that seals offer a semiotic infrastructure, which brings participants in the project of nuclear verification together to be able to signal and communicate with each other. And it's a common framework for the flows of perhaps in the article I call it trust, um, and that perhaps this is in fact the work of nuclear verification, right? It's uh, the development of an elaborate semiotic system or, you know, of which ledgers are a part, which coordinates participants around a common project and provides a basis for a common reality. And out of this comes my sort of my interest and my questioning in trust. So what is trust? Um, there's a vast literature across the social sciences and the humanities in the social sciences, particularly um, psychologists, sociologists, political scientists love to um, categorize trust. There's you know, various typologies of different kinds of trust. Um, and I guess I would suggest that there's sort of diminishing analytical utility in coming up with the 36 different ways, different kinds of trust. Um, and I sort of tried to, or was more intrigued by explanations um, that took a historical perspective and showed that trust is actually um, a kind of affective orientation or uh, almost, I mean, becomes like a normative moral good, uh, a sentiment at a particular moment in time. So um, Steve Shapin actually in his social history of truth and in his introduction um, traces um, trust as becoming an occupation of the Scottish enlightenment, right? Which he notes is the same time as Sort of the emergence of friendship, right, of association or of uh, friendly relations between free equals. Um, and trust becomes the kind of thing that governs those, those new kinds of social relations. Uh, and Shapin's argument is also that the, the gentleman, right, the gentleman scientist um, becomes the only trustworthy source of information or truth because he is not beholden or bound to anyone else. He's independent and his situatedness is thought to be disinterestedness. So we, I see a resonance there to expectations of truth in the blockchain as neutral and objective. Um, another person I wanna mention, a, a German historian, Ute Prevert, who wrote a book um, that also situates um, trust as, a, an, as something that emerges really at the beginning of sort of the modern age, right? Of, of modernity, right? You have the decline of religion and she has this amazing, um, notes, you know, does a sort of like etymology or like, let's look at the dictionary. And the trust used to be something that you only had in God. You did not have it in other people. And then eventually the definition changes and trust is something that you have in other people. So, you know, relationships between trust and faith and things like that continue to resonate, I think, in the way that we understand the concept today. Um, so I'm interested in it less as a, an analytic and more as sort of a, an actor's category, right? Like, how do we understand this term? Um, what is it meant to do? Why is it so morally laden, right? It's not, you know, trust is a good thing, you know, the decline of trust is terrible, things like that. 
Um, and um, Seligman, who's an anthropologist of religion, has also written a book where he sort of situates it as, you know, uh, as this, a, a concept that emerges at a particular time and place in response to changing social relations. Um, and that's sort of how I tried to look at it. Um, so nevertheless, I still found it helpful, find it helpful to take these sort of three categories or maybe sort of layers of abstraction or layers of um, analysis in uh, thinking about trust. So, um, and also I, I want to note, I feel like no slideshow is complete without an AI generated image. So this is, I, the prompt for this was trust in the style of Salvador Dali. So I think what is interesting is that maybe you see a sort of hanging in the balance, right? Like the concept of risk being in there somehow. Um, maybe that's just my interpretation. So um, these three ways of thinking about trust that I think are helpful when listening to people talk about it. So one way is confidence, right? Uh, Nicholas Luhmann's terms, it's system vertrauen. So trust in the system, uh, which is a sort of institutional trust that like the institutions will keep doing what they're doing. The DMV will be always be dysfunctional in the way that we know. Um, interpersonal trust, so the sense of like risk and reliance on other people. Um, and then the sense of a shared reality, um, like in what way do we understand to be inhabiting the same reality with others uh, when we you know go to the store and stand in line. And um, it's really uh, this underlying understanding, this um, underlying shared sense of reality was um, the ethnomethodologist Harold Garfinkel's big project in the 1960s. Um, and he conducted along with his students, um, what were called breaching experiments that, that showed how quickly um, our shared sense of reality could be um, shattered. Um, in, for example, he asked his students to, uh, when they went home over the holidays to act as if they were boarders in their own home um, and to see, you know, how, how did his family react? And sometimes, you know, people reacted really violently towards the sort of questioning of, you know, are we, is this the same reality that we share? Um, so, and uh, one suggestion about how to understand what blockchain permits um, is proposed in this paper by Primavera de Filippi. Uh, she's a recipient of a five-year ERC grant to develop blockchain powered distributed governance for communities, institutions, and the world. And she and her co-authors build on Seligman's argument that there is a difference between trust and confidence. And trust is seen as individualized and confidence depends on internalized expectations deriving from knowledge or past experiment, uh, experiences. And her argument is that, or their argument is that blockchain produces confidence rather than trust. And that confidence is a shared assumption in a technology functioning in a predictable and reliable way. Um, and it's also a matter of procedural correctness and reliability. And here in the sense of uh, procedure and correctness, I see a you know, strong resonance to bureaucracy. And there's some people who've made that argument too, that some of the blockchain based organizations basically function as kinds of bureaucracies. Um, and they, the authors, the thing that they also argue is that confidence in the blockchain is produced in the technological aspect, the on-chain bits, but that trust is nevertheless necessary and distrib distributed across all the actors that participate to regulate and govern the blockchain and intervene when something goes wrong, which is usually called the off-chain bit. So this is just to so kind of give you a brief overview. Web3 governance is commonly understood as being three discrete parts. So there's either the on-chain aspect itself. So the kinds of things that you can automate uh, on the blockchain through algorithms. So if people um, vote with their tokens in a particular way to upgrade um, the blockchain, you know, in, given a proposal, then, you know, that passes automatically and the change will be made. And the off-chain is the sort of coordinating mechanisms around it. Um, that are maybe formalized to a certain extent or, or also informal, um, but it's basically that uh, a sort of non-technologically encoded way that network stakeholders can coordinate amongst themselves informally to decide how network upgrades are handled, for example. And um, most networks today actually employ off-chain systems. Um, and I can explain later how that works. And then um, IRL, I'm referring to sort of the, the regulatory um, 
environments that these that uh, blockchain networks are existing within and sort of brushing up against. So the SEC, other forms of um, uh, law. So like what kind of an entity is a decentralized autonomous organization? So the DAO is uh, an organizational form that has as its, as its technological infrastructure a blockchain. Um, and there are people, you know, founding startups as DAOs. Um, and some of the, there, there, there too, there's a lot of sort of um, confusion or maybe, uh, you know, semantic expansiveness about like what a DAO might be or what it isn't. Um, but a sort of basic understanding is that all the contributors to a DAO, um, there's sort of an assumption that there's some kind of, um, that there's not, a, it's a flat hierarchy or like every, everyone has sort of the same say or the same kind of vote. Um, so, yeah. Um, okay. Um, then I find really helpful, um, the scholar Jan Loos did a sort of STS analysis of different socio-technical imaginaries of governance that exist in Web3 or specifically in the Ethereum um, ecosystem. And he argues that the ideological framework of crypto anarchism definitely influenced the early development of cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin. But he notes there is also this open source nature of blockchain based technologies that produced different approaches and perspectives and how to use this technology. So for Ethereum, which is the alternative to Bitcoin, as I mentioned, Los it identifies three socio technical imaginaries of governance that he associates with specific individuals. So Gavin Wood, who we remember from the beginning, um, is sort of representative for a kind of governance that is fully automated and algorithmic, right? Like the fewer people, the better. And we want to take the human arbitrariness out of governance, which I think most of us probably think of as like incredibly dystopian and, and scary. Um, and it's sort of it's associated with a with a a notion of code as law, which is something that Lawrence Lessig sort of articulated but has been misunderstood by um, generations of engineers ever since. Um, and then the second one is a, a techno-social approach, um, which is characterized by um, uh, somebody named Vlad Zamfir, um, which is against the code, code is law um, kind of dictum and is an approach that wants to keep humans in the loop and to sort of engage with messiness and to maintain the possibility of a hard fork as the possibility of dissent. And then the third vision or socio-technical imaginary is uh, represented by the work of Vitalik Buterin and Glenn uh, Weil, uh, which Lewis characterizes as radical liberal liberalism. Um, Weil, uh, Weil wrote a book in 2018 with Eric Posner called Radical Markets, which uh, imagines that you know the way that uh, market capitalism has been working is not you know, to the benefit of, you know, most of humanity, but if we just do it right and do it in this particular way, um, then we can achieve the kind of equality and freedom that we want. And uh, Vitalik Buterin, co-founder of Ethereum, finds this very interesting and um, basically is, is sort of is a proponent of the idea that markets and mechanism design can come together to, to, to in, in the engineering of crypto economic systems that have particular outcomes. So you decide on the outcome in advance, right? You want a kind of, I don't know, re redistribution or some kind of equity, and then you design the crypto economic system in order to produce that outcome. So also, you know, very techno utopian. So here's, um, I'm gonna end with just two examples of when things go wrong that, are, that have become sort of canonical or important um, examples in the Web3 space. So the first one was in 2016. Um, the, the, the first DAO, the DAO, was hacked um, and basically sort of imploded the project before it could even get started. Um, the DAO was sort of a, the first crowdfunded investment vehicle on the Ethereum blockchain. Uh, and if you want to read more about it, there's a great ethnographic account by Quinn DuPont. Um, who was also a participant, so a participant observer in this in this experiment. Um, briefly, what happened is that um, this project had a vesting period where everyone, you know, contributed their money, and then sort of a, a kind of a pause period during which it was discovered that there was an, a bug in the code that somebody had exploited in order to drain funds, the funds from, you know, this treasury, um, which, uh, you know, probably would have tanked the value of, of Ethereum as a currency, of Ether. 
Um, so then, you know, there was a lot of discussion about it and the kind of the core contributors decided that what they would do um, was to hard fork, right? To basically sort of roll back the immutable blockchain to an earlier time and, and fork and go into a different direction. And then the fork works if like all of your contributors, those who are committing and working on the system follow you, right? And continue working on that part of the fork. The, the sort of original, the hack part still exists. It's called Ethereum Classic, but it's um, you know not as vibrant as the, the actual fork one. And it's interesting, you can basically in the Web3 space sort of tell what somebody's politics on you know uh, blockchain governance are if you ask them about the DAO and the DAO hack and if they think that you know it's solved the right way or not. So it's almost like a fun kind of litmus test. Um, okay, and then the second example happened more recently last year. Um, the Juno network is another blockchain ecosystem that um, that that did an airdrop. I don't know, did, 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 yeah, carried out an airdrop. An airdrop is sort of the dropping of tokens into uh, wallet holders, account holders' wallets, um, with the the or the the rules that were articulated with the airdrop was that um, you know there was a certain limit to how many tokens any one account holder could have, and once they did the airdrop, they ended up seeing that there was one account holder who had somehow consolidated like way more many tokens than they had sort of articulated as part of the rules. Um, and they, you know, went, reached out and they were like, what's happening here? That's, you know, against what we intended. And this person says, oh, I'm holding these, uh, these tokens for other people. I'm like an investor, right? Uh, and, and they were like, okay, well, but you know, this is, you know, still against the rules. And he's like, oh, what, cause, because one of the things that you can, if you have a lot of tokens, you can influence the governance in uh, one token, one vote systems. Um, and so initially they thought, okay, he's, you know, he's promising to play along and to not like uh, exert undue influence on governance processes, but then that apparently didn't go well at some point. Um, so they decided, or, you know, the majority of the network decided to basically revoke this account holder. They're called whales when they have a large amount of tokens, um, this account holder's tokens and to put them in sort of a community um, fund that you know belongs to the whole network and that too was a you know um, an important moment in web3 in general in the way that people are paying attention to what does it mean to um, you know have governance to make decisions to um, to follow through on your vision um, and how do you deal with people who ascend, you know who kind of go against that how do you sanction people who uh, go yeah and uh, yes, so then um, I have two quotes there. there I, I wasn't able to figure out how to like make this uh, one part, but they're basically um, a tweet thread kind of thing. Um, and uh, Jake Hartnell is part of an, an organization called DAO DAO, which creates DAO tooling for DAOs. Um, and I think it, it almost sounds like he's Yes, anyway, so basically he's just kind of pointing out, even when you think there aren't politics, there are always politics, right? Because we're human beings and we're trying to figure out how to do things together. So don't be so surprised. This is, you know, this is how it is. And, you know, referring back to the original DAO hack as, you know, a moment in, you know, Web3's recent history that, um, you know, served as a, a, an orienting um, event. So um, this is my last slide. Uh, this is um, something that Vitalik Buterin said in one of his many blog posts. If you want to read anything about um, yeah, Ethereum, he has written uh, many texts and there's a book of essays of his blog posts that um, comes out as this. But I, I like this because he's really articulating sort of what the problem is, right? That if you have an online ecosystem that anyone can participate in, you know, there's an, an anticipation that people will come who are trying to do things that are not what you want them to do, right? So how do you deal with coordination that um, you don't want? And I think it really gets to the core of the issue. If you start asking like, who is we, right? And how can this we be so sure of its stability? Um, because conflicts arise when a we that has presumed itself oriented around a common goal discovers that the basis of its we-ness is not as obvious as it first thought. Um, 
at the same time in the space, people are experimenting with liquid democracy, with sortition, with quadratic voting to see if these kinds of decision-making mechanisms can help produce better governance. Um, in the meantime, I think Web3 is an exciting space to watch for attempts to work through the fundamental questions of social theory, which is how humans do things together. And in this sense, I think blockchain does offer a socio-technical infrastructure for figuring out how to coordinate, whether that involves trust, confidence, or some basic assumption in the existence of, of what Wittgenstein called a shared form of life. And ethnographic research is one way to discover hidden assumptions and follow the conflicts to see what people are arguing about and what values and ideologies are clashing, uh, what, how they are producing rifts and forks. So I look forward to your question. I hope this was you know, a whirlwind overview. I'm happy to answer any more in-depth questions. Thank you. Great. Well, as usual, we'll take the first questions from current postdoctoral and pre-doctoral fellows. And after we take a few of those, we'll open it up to others. So um, I'll try to keep a running list. And if you're listening online, you can ask a question in the, the Q&A thread and I'll bring that up too. Okay, fellows. Yeah, sure, Liam. No. <laughs> You. <laughs> Here, okay. Hi, thanks so much for your talk. My name is Julie George. I'm a pre-doctoral fellow here at CSAC at the Institute for Human-Centered AI. Um, I really enjoyed this presentation and learned a lot. And I'm just wondering, do you think that there are any alternative forms of governance beyond Ethereum and Bitcoin that expand to, let's say, BNB or other types of cryptocurrencies? Um, I'm talking mainly because of, you know, where these centers of powers can be um, and how that might look different in other areas of the world. What do you mean with BNB? I'm sorry. I don't, oh, like, uh, okay. Uh, Binance, the current cryptocurrency okay, and yeah. seeing like different spheres of influence. Um, so the question is what uh, sort of what are alternatives or outside of Ethereum or who, what are the other ecosystems that are powerful or something like that? Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not really keeping up on top of that. I know that there's, uh, you know, several others that are, I think, but the, I think the ones that I know more about are the ones that are orienting towards Ethereum as kind of like the, you know, the sun in their ecosystem and it's trying to build things on top of that. So poke it out with like inter, you know, inter blockchain sort of operability. Um, and I don't know if there's like any one, I mean, you can look to the big chains as like uh, those that have, you know, that are, that are working through um, specific kinds of governance challenges. I think the what I'm looking for more in my research is sort of smaller projects and how they are dealing um, with the various things that come up. Um, yeah. Thanks. Hey, Ian. Hey, Ian Reynolds, pre-doc fellow here at CSAC and HAI. Um, I, I kind of wanted to give you some more space maybe to reflect on this relationship between verification and trust, um, because in many ways, for me, they seem so interrelated. Like if we don't trust our apparatuses of verification, then we just get into like a verification redux all the way down. Um, so do you kind of envision trust as more as a practice or a lived experiences of negotiated kind of ways of going about interacting with one another? and and in some ways, do you envision um, people who are part of this Web 3.0 community as kind of, you mentioned Wittgenstein, but kind of playing Wittgensteinian language games with trust and, you know, deploying it in a way that's um, useful for them in, in their own context and organizations. So thank you. Yeah. Um, trust and verification, what, what do we mean? Yeah, I mean, uh, um, I think that that is, so I'll maybe start with the Wittgenstein. Well, I th so I think what, what I'm observing or what I'm interested in are these moments of where there's sort of a presumed universality, right? That we think that we, we all mean and want the same thing, um, which I think is pretty prevalent in engineering. Um, I think there's sort of an ethos of like the universality of code, of 
of you know numbers, math, that kind of thing. Um, that this is something that like is almost like a culture or value free, right? Um, and that anyone can have access to. And, and then I think what what you end up seeing, and I think specifically in in Web three in the crypto space, is that there are people who are coming to this to these projects with different interests, right? With um, with different forms of life that uh, only and that only emerges in sort of moments of conflict or when you realize, oh, um, we need to decide on something, and those people actually don't share, you know, what we think this network is about. So um, I think a lot of or the way that 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 pro that plays out um, most obviously is on uh, is in Bitcoin and but also in other sort of uh, mining, yeah, other other spaces where you have the the validators or the miners who are maybe in China, right, uh, and who have a different set of commitments to this technology or, or who are being motivated by something other than what the people in you know. The North America are, are motivated by. And um, I think there's sort of an assumption that governments should be easier than it is. And then there's this puzzlement, like, why is it so hard, right? And um, I'm actually find really helpful um, Chris Kelty, who, you know, wrote one of the first books on uh, open source software and is uh, very grumpy about Web3 and his promises, because he's like, oh, well, haven't we seen this before? Isn't this the same set of ideas? Um, but he, uh, in 2019, his book, The Participants came out and he sort of talk, talks about like the notion of participation um, and that, uh, and he uses Wittgenstein's forms of life to say that, you know, when different, when we have the same form of life, when we share sort of a basic set of values, then disagreement is possible and we can actually, sort of communicate or work across those differences. Um, but when we uh, don't share forms of life, then what happens is perplexity. Like we don't even know how to engage because um, what you know is coming up is so alien or strange to us. And um, I guess, I mean, I, I have thought about this sort of in abstract terms about what it means to do arms control, to do diplomacy, you know, what are the, and, and I think one of the things that works in diplomacy is that you have, you know, diplomats who are sort of who share enough, right, of, in terms of their position, um, their structural position and their sort of professionalization and the idea of like what the, the diplomat does in a specific role that, um, th that allows them to like sort of speak across or like to permit this kind of conversation. And I guess maybe, um, well, maybe in addition to language games, I wanna bring the concept of translation into this. Like what are the, the ways that we need to translate or be able to translate across forms of life and across you know, ways of understanding the world? Okay, let's see. Are you, Estella? Okay. Hi, I'm Rhiannon Nielsen. I'm the Cybersecurity Postdoctoral Fellow here at CSAC. Um, I learned so much from your talk. I don't know anything about Web3, so this was super enlightening. Um, you talked a lot about truth, trust, and verification. And one of the things that really stood out to me throughout your presentation was truth, trust, and punishment, the notion of punishment and how when we violate trust, there's typically avenues for which we can punish people. If people are intentionally dishonest or they um, are negligent to the extent that they act on things that are not truthful, we can punish them. And I was just wondering to what extent punishment in the form of governance in Web3 comes up in your research. If there's no, if there's no human in the loop, or if, you know, we're not able to punish AI or algorithms, like how does that take form? Thank you. Yeah. So, so the kind of what are the unintended consequences of maybe an algorithmic process that is doing what we don't want it to do? And yeah, I guess more just that you know we are able to punish governments when they do things that we don't like. I mean, the most violent form of that is like up, uh, uprising and resisting that kind of overarching systems. I think when we when we do talk about these big concepts like truth and trust, it's usually because we have a recourse to punish someone if they violate these mm -hmm. these values. Yeah, but but who are we punishing in, in Web3 and web, in web in governments? Well, I think there usually it's there's a human author at the end of whatever is happening or goes wrong, right? So there's often like you're able to like find someone and hold somebody accountable for it. Um, but I guess on the, the concept of truth and trust, I also want to offer, I think, something that's important to, um, to add to the conversation that 
these, these expectations we have about sincerity and, and, and truthfulness and trustworthiness are not culturally universal, right? They're not, they're not universal human orientations. Um, and the, the most helpful um, text on this um, is by an anthropologist uh, whose name is Matthew Carey. I uh, wrote a book, open source, you can get it on by um, how, how publishers um, called Mistrust. And um, he, his field work was, it is in the, the High Atlas in Morocco. And one of his sort of, you know, uh, first understandings, you know, going there as a, as a Westerner to do research is this sort of realization that people didn't um, sort of speculate about other people's intentions um, and that they, uh, and that, uh, and at the same time, there was not an expectation of like sincerity, even among like very intimate people. So one of the quotes that he has that, um, you know, feels very like um, uh, crazy to us, I think to Westerners is um, that one of his informants said to him, well, of course he would lie to me, I'm his sister, right? So there's a very different expectation of like what, uh, how you interact with other people, what you can tell about them. And he said, this, is, this didn't mean that like people lied to each other about important things all the time, but it was more about like, if you met somebody, uh, you know, walking to the village or something like that, and you, and you were like, oh, what have you been up to? They'll like tell you something that maybe isn't true, right? Or they'll like make up something about what they did um, because there's sort of a sense or um, there's a, a kind of cultural sense of that you can protect that, right? Like it's, it's nobody's business what you've been up to. Um, and I think, um, I've actually thought about that a little bit in terms of the Iran uh, verification stuff that there's this sort of insistence on sincerity on, and on coming clean um, that I think we're importing that has a very like Christian valence, like a Protestant valence even, um, that I think has become like universalized or normalized as like, well, that is just how a moral person is, right? And I think what's helpful uh, and why I, I like being an anthropologist is knowing that there's other ways to be in the world, right? That there's like different value systems and different moral codes that are, you know, not better or worse, um, but that, you know, organize uh, social cooperation in a different way and, you know, punish people in different ways, right? Like what, what are you punishable for um, is also something that is not the same everywhere. Okay, uh, I'll take Herb and then you, and down there, and then there, and Cameron. Okay. And that, that was a great talk. I mean, just, um, and, and so thank, thank, thank you very much. And the two, two comments on it that, um, one was the, the, the notion that you, you raised about um, trust having slippery meanings. Okay, I mean, that, that was the focus of a large part of your remarks and so on. And, and rather than focusing on, on, on web trust and, the web, and, and web three, it might actually be worthwhile exploring different notions of trust um, more, more generally. I mean, it, and it comes up, of course, time and again in the arms control context. And you know, what does it mean to, to trust the other side to, to enter into an agreement mm -hmm. and, and, and so on? I mean, for me, the, the, the I mean, I'm a Web3 skeptic, but you know, I'll put my cards on the ta on the table there. Um, I think there's a, there's something very very important in 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 an exploration of the different meanings of trust, um, and, and it'd be very important in an arms control context. Second is that this notion that there is you know that that the cryptographically based versions of trust are accessible to everyone is just bullshit, right? Because there, there's a you know you're you know the math is impenetrable to any to everyone except a small body of specialists, and to the extent that I mean there are complicated cryptographic protocols that are being proposed to to do verification and arms control too, okay, and it's going to be very interesting to see whether or not the scientists on the Russian side are trusted by the diplomats in negotiating it, and 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 you know on the American side as as, as well. Because they'll, what they'll do is they'll come up with a bunch of mathematical formula and they'll say, yes, it, it, it's the truth. But the diplomats won't understand anything that they said except the outcome. And so there's a, there's a very interesting kind of, of trust. That, you know, the diplomats, if we were going to actually make the decision, have to trust their own mathematicians. Well, I mean, you know, there's a limit to how much you, will, you ought to be willing to trust a mathematician. <laughs> I'm speaking as a physicist. Um, 
So th there, there are many interesting nuances to this, and I'd love to find an opportunity to talk to you about it another time in more, de in more depth. This is a gr it was a great talk. Thanks, Herb. Thank you so much for coming. Um, yeah, just to uh, respond, absolutely. I think, yeah, the, the slipperiness is one of the things that I want to follow. Um, and, and in terms of, yeah, that it's, that it's an elitist claim that doesn't recognize that it's elitist is like, uh, yeah, absolutely accurate, right? There's sort of no recognition of like how much you need to know and the kind of equipment you need to have in order to access this kind of thing. So I'm obviously very skeptical of the sort of universal claims to greatness and things like that. And I think that's something that we see a lot in STS in the history of science um, is this sort of like uh, unfolding, like all of the sort of leaps of faith, right, that you have to make when, you know, people working in large interdisciplinary, uh, you know, if we think of the Manhattan Project, right, there's people from all kinds of fields that have to work together uh, in order to accomplish something. And, you know, they can't be experts on everything. So you have to sort of, you know, trust or rely on or, you know, have confidence that the person you're working alongside that their expertise will hold, you know, hold what you need to do. Um, and I think, yeah, and I think, yeah, I, I mean, the arms control example is really great in that, in that sense too, that, you know, we live in a highly stratified society with lots of, you know, specialized forms of expertise and we can't know everything. And I think that's something you see maybe that comes culturally out of a sort of hacker culture that where there's a sense of like, oh, I can grok this, you know, I can like figure out anything uh, and learn it, and therefore, you know, everyone else must be like this as well. Um, that I think also is part of what uh, motivates the, these these claims. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Anne, for a, a terrific talk. My question uh, is about the salience of um, secrecy and trust, and the ability to keep secrets, and the ability to maintain a secret society style uh, group. I wonder if uh, that has any explanatory factors or what do you think of it? So this would entail us doing uh, these little, you know, let's call them technological clubs for the sake of argument and their ability to keep the secrets or, you know, keep the trust, the faith of those who you know, enter them. Do you think that has uh, an explanatory power? Do you think it's relevant or this kind of thinking, you know, secrecy and keeping secrets and trust? Yes, and I, and I think I'm thinking about it in terms of, I guess, diplomatic negotiations, right? Or this sort of maybe a, a kind of sliding scale from transparency to opacity um, where, or, you know, something like Chatham House rules. If you think about the ways that people are trying to create conditions of shared understanding and that, you know, transparency or openness are not necessarily the best conditions, right? Or and even if you think of the term confidence, right? You can have confidence in an institution, but you can also say something to somebody in confidence, right? And you create sort of a, uh, yeah, a, a kind of a subset or a smaller set of relations that um, is, you know, so somehow like increasing some kind of bond or opening channels of communication that um, maybe allow you to come to some kind of shared understanding. And I think, yeah, maybe not, you know, exclusively secrecy, but thinking of it as a sort of spectrum of like what, um, yeah, where you go and what it allows. And um, I mean, a lot of uh, people in the Web3 space are also realizing that privacy is really important and maybe you don't want everything out in the open. Um, so recognizing the, the, the power and the necessity for you know, privacy or forms of secrecy or opacity um, are also being discussed or recognized. Yeah, in this space, thank you. Uh, at the end of the table, yeah. How's it going? Um, I'm Damah Warna. I'm a PhD student in communication. Um, and yeah, thank you for your talk. Extremely interesting. And I was uh, wondering, thinking about FTX uh, situation and also crypto scams and rug pulls, it seems to me that there's uh, an instrumentalization of the rhetoric and discourse around de decentralization that this sometimes doesn't really translate to, to the material world, right? So I'm thinking there might be like a sort of like a decoupling or a mismatch there. And I was wondering if you have thoughts about that. And also, if so, how do you work with this methodologically in your methodologically? research? Methodologically? Yeah. Uh, well, yes, I think a lot of the people in this space are also aware, right, of the, what, what does decentralization mean? When is it used? When is it misused? I mean, there was the, um, I forget his name, the Signal co-founder, um, Moxie Marlin Spikes, you know, kind of critique last year, a year and a half ago of, um, the, the, that of the centralized infrastructure-ness of a lot of these, you know, 
you know, NFT providers and things like that. Um, and I think there's, there is also relatively high level discussion about like, oh, what, you know, what are we talking about when we talk about decentralization? Is it the actual infrastructure itself? Is it like the power relations and how do we, uh, how do we do what we want? The other thing that I've noticed um, since the since FT, since the FTX um, uh, bankruptcy scandal um, is that th some of the people that I uh, talk to in the space, or there's a sense of like, you know, good riddance. These things need to be flushed out because they weren't decentralized in the first place. So there's definitely also a belief or a faith that like if we do it properly and if it is truly decentralized, then these things won't happen. Right? That decentralization in itself is sort of a a guard against these forms of corruption, right? Um, and then you said, how do I work on that methodologically? I mean, I've, I follow these things as like discourses and arguments, right? Um, that, that different uh, groups make about what is at stake and what they think that they are dealing with. Yeah. Thanks, Grant. And just in the interest of time, let's take Trond and then Cameron and uh, put just two questions together. Great question. Here, I'm uh, Tron here, here at uh, CSEC. Um, I'm interested in what you uh, are saying, clearly, uh, that there's a growing kind of institutionalization of blockchain because it's starting to appear also in more traditional power structures, right? So you described it in, or the idea of using it in arms control. And banks famously were very skeptical to the concept early on but they have now started to uh, um, you know embrace it and there are also regulatory authorities that have taken first uh, you know blocking it but then starting to take more permissive approaches do you think that <clears throat> as this process goes on that it's possible to envision that this architecture of uh, a, a decentralized ledger becomes a de facto governance principle also for highly bureaucratic and perhaps top-down organizations? Becomes a governance principle. Um, I don't know. I'm very bad at predicting things. Um, I th what I think is, yeah, I, I agree your um, sort of um, your diagnosis, right? Or noticing that the, the skepticism has turned into more of like an interest and in sort of like, well, how can we use this technology? I guess it's, you know, it's kind of sticking around. So like, how might we use it? Um, and then there's the important sort of distinction between a, a permissionless and a permission blockchain, right? You can have a private blockchain as well, which is one of the, 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 the um, possible use cases in arms control or verification scenarios, um, you know, supply chain types of things. Um, I, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I think you're, t you're talking more about like sort of on a conceptual level, right? Like how might uh, what the blockchain affords be sort of introduced into an organizational structure, a bureaucratic structure? Um, I don't know. I haven't thought about that, but that's a great question. And the only thing that I can think of that uh, I don't, um, it's not exactly relevant, but relevant to California. I don't know if you saw that the D California DMV is um, working to put titles, like the, the title registry for uh, automobiles on a blockchain and working with, yeah, one of the blockchain networks to do that. Um, you know, I guess supposedly in order to prevent people from like selling lemons, like out of state lines, but you know, they would need other states to also have <laughs> other DMVs and other states to have that too. So there's, there's definitely also some of that, um, problems, um, or solutions chasing problems kind of stuff, but thank you for your question. I will keep thinking about it. If you have an idea, I'm happy to chat. Cameron. Cameron Tracy, research scholar at CSAC. Uh, you highlighted this discourse among proponents of some of these technologies that it's inherently an emancipatory endeavor, that the, the code is infallible and they're trying to get rid of the human element and uh, arbitrary authority and so on. Uh, it was interesting, I thought, that the two examples you gave fed right into that narrative, at least the way the headlines framed them, that these were instances where the human factor failed and the code wasn't allowed to, you know, uh, carry out its infallible um, path forward. Are there examples that those proponents of this narrative have trouble squaring with this idea of, of the infallibility of the code? Or is it simply the case that anything can be fit into the box of uh, the code can't fail, it can only be failed? Hmm. 
Yeah, I don't know. I think there's maybe two sides of it. I think that there there are some people who believe that like they can make the perfect system, right? That will like never fail. Um, but I, and I, but I think that the others are, or that there are other more pragmatic actors, right? Who recognize that like, no, it's this code is the stuff we write. Of course it's buggy and like, it's never gonna be perfect. And so we want to be able to maintain the ability to change it. And, and actually it's not a failure, right? Like to see the, what the Juno network did, for example, as a failure is like, well, what, what is it a failure of, right? Is it that, you know, the code didn't run by itself or like, is, is the point to continue this project, you know, according to the principles that were articulated by human actors. Um, and so I think that's maybe an interesting thing that I might wanna um, sort of follow across these sort of, you know, scandals or failures or whatever is the way that it's framed, right? Is it, is it you know, a human failure or are we reading that into it? Or, you know, what, what is a success? Like, is it, yeah, so thanks. Okay, well, we're out of time. I'm just gonna add one comment of my own as we fade out, which is, which might be useful to you. So the original meaning of the word that became truth in the English language had to do not with fidelity to reality, but with true as in my true love or uh, uh, true to the cause. Mm -hmm. So it had to do with loyalty to a person or a cause, but not, it was not a relationship to reality at all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, Thanks, okay. Paul. Yeah, great. All right, let's thank Anna.